So, I watched this debate on Zach's channel, Is Evil Evidence Against God? With our own Emerson Green. Emerson Green? Of TikTok fame? Yes, that Emerson Green, the, tic the famous TikToker who I had on my channel not too long ago. Uh, why? Because I, I, I like his stuff, actually. He does a lot on philosophy of mind, and I like... I like, I read a lot of his blog and I like a lot of the stuff he did, so he's on my channel talking about panpsychism and philosophy of mind. Now, in this particular debate, he lays down three cases why it would be more likely that God does not exist. Uh, one of the other things I like about him is he tends to argue positive cases for naturalism, um, which is, you know, useful for us, because he lays down three points. And, he's, and he basically makes a probabilistic inference to the best explanation type argument. Uh, the first one I'm going to leave aside, it's one he's borrowed from Paul Draper. I, I, I'm going to do a standalone video on Paul Draper at some point. He's pretty heavily influenced by Paul Draper. A lot of atheists will point at Paul Draper as, you know, an exceptional. And Paul Draper has his seven, I think it's seven cases for naturalism. I'm going to do a standalone video on just those arguments from Paul Draper. So I'll go to the horse's mouth for that one and leave it aside for now. So let's look at his other two. And what he is making is a kind of inference to the best ex explanation. This is more likely, it is surpri here's phenomena X. This phenomena is surprising if the given theism is far more likely in a world where God does not exist, far more likely given naturalism. Now it's interesting because surprising is his choice of words and surprising is totally subjective. But the first thing he appeals to he borrows from Schopenhauer, and let's call it the turtles being eaten on a beach argument against the existence of God. Apparently there's this beach somewhere in the universe, and I'm pretty sure this is a real thing. I know it's a real argument from Schopenhauer, and I forget the details, but I'm pretty sure it's an actual place um, where there are these turtles who are sitting on a beach, given life only to be torn apart by wild dogs. So this one beach somewhere in the world, it seems like there's this complete moral nihilistic universe where the moral, the, moral, the moral of the universe has been totally upended and there's a world of just suffering, sorrow. People, things are given life just to, you know, suffer and die. Now, why I think this is actually useful for theism, a couple of different reasons. First of all, it's interesting to note that, that Schopenhauer is by Emerson Green's own de de description. He brings up Schopenhauer a couple times in his blogs, uh, um, Schopenhauer's arguments for consciousness, things like that. Now, I really like Schopenhauer. The reason I like Schopenhauer is because there's a book, The, will, uh, the World is Will and Representation. And what you will find with layman philosophers like myself is the, the philosophers that people like and they find popular because it's a really simple reason because the books are good and easy to read. The world is real, as will and representation. You don't need to be a philosophical expert. It's a really good book, really easy to read. I read it a long time ago. It's excellent. And he was heavily influential on Nietzsche. Now, you find that a lot. Generally, the most popular philosophers on a college campus are Nietzsche, easy to read, fun to read, relatively speaking. I'm saying you can read these books for pleasure. Now, some people can't, but you can. Kierkegaard, Camus, you know, and Schopenhauer. Try doing that, making the same argument about someone like Hegel. Try reading The Phenomenology of the Spirit. You can go look it up today and try reading it. It's practically illegible. It's so, I, I can't, I have never been able to work my way through it. I think I get like 50 pages into it at the most, and then I give up. Ditto for Kant. Kant is notoriously difficult to understand, and you sit down and read some of his... Uh, some of his more famous works, and you find yourself like struggling to understand it, and it isn't pleasurable to read at all. So the ones that people usually like, the pop, the more popular philosophers are popular for a reason. Why? Because they're enjoyable to read. They're good writers, and Schopenhauer is that. But what's interesting about Schopenhauer, and this is even according to Emerson, who's a fan of Schopenhauer's, he's probably the most pessimistic person who ever walked the face of the earth, <laughs> and a deeply unpleasant human being. And now we know why, because he spends his time thinking about dogs tearing apart turtles on beaches somewhere in the universe. Not going to make you the most cheery of people. You're not exactly a cheery optimist. Now, why is this argument so interesting? Is because I actually live on a beach. And, furthermore, Emerson asks us to appeal to phenomenal consciousness. What he's trying to argue is there's gratuitous evil. 
And he's saying that given theism, there should be no gratuity. We shouldn't be able to find gratuitous evil, and we can at least find some. And he makes an appeal to phenomenal conservatism. Phenomenal conservatism, if you do not know, says that that which appears true, that which seems to, to you to be true, you are reasonably justified to believe, absent defeaters. So, let's look at this turtles being killed on a beach. Now, I live on a beach. And I, I literally walk down my stairs and walk down another flight of stairs and you are on a beach in Southern California. No turtles are being eaten by wild dogs. So we don't see this phenomena. It is what I call the evil anomaly argument. Atheists use this argument all the time. Usually they use it with design. When the arguments for the design, they go, the world can't be designed, you know, can't be designed present in the universe. Why? Because here's this disease where these bugs eat, I think it's children's eyes, and it's so terrible, nobody would ever design that. It's the evil anomaly argument. And this is, a, this is an example of it. It is the exception that proves the rule. I live on a beach. You go to my beach right now, you aren't going to see any turtles being eaten by wild dogs. Matter of fact, you're going to see a relatively benign, pleasant place where kids are playing. There's waves crashing. I go to the beach all the time. You know, there's once I've seen a seal. A well, long time ago, I think I saw a whale off in the distance. The beach is, for the most part, here in Southern California, is a benevolent, fun, happy place. It isn't a, a universe of suffering and death that is the one beach somewhere in the universe where that is happening. And yeah, that's a little weird, but by his own argument, we are to look at the world as it actually is and decide for ourselves what is more likely, that naturalism or God. Now, if we look at the world as it actually is, Yes, there are the evil anomalies, but they are the exception that proves the rule. What you will find far more surprising, if there were no God and there were no sovereign hand over, over the world, and we were just all subject to natural processes, you would find the, the, the turtle on the beach everywhere. We would be the turtles on the beach, and we aren't. Most of us live our lives to one degree or another. In Christian theology, this is explained. In naturalism, this is almost impossible to account for. Most of us live our lives in relative protection and relative stability and relative ease. I say relative, sometimes some of you deal with really challenging and difficult circumstances. But I say relative. Let's call it the argument from Kobe Bryant. Do you all remember what happened when Kobe Bryant died in that plane crash? It was really, really jarring to the culture as a whole. question is why. Why? Because it was weird. It seemed so random. Indeed, in that particular situation, it was in fact random. There was some sort of either mechanical malfunction in the helicopter or the guy lost visibility. I forget the exact details, but it was basically a random accident and some really famous person all of a sudden was taken from us. Now, why did, why did people find that so traumatic? Is because it seemed so random. Seemed so random. If this were a world of natural processes just visiting, there would, there would be no respite. Death and destruction would be visiting us all the time, at will, randomly, and there'd be no way to psychologically deal with it. That's the point I'm trying to make. What, by his own argument, what seems to be true, he argues that this is a morally unintelligible universe, and actually it isn't. That's the point. Yes, there are the anomalies. There are exceptions that prove the rule. There are the evil anomalies. There are these times where random suffering seems to happen. But those are actually relatively rare. They try to account for them in Christian theology. Most Christian theology posits that you are going to live a life, if you're a good person, you are going to expect a life of trials and tribulations to some degree. You know, the Bible doesn't make any, any bones about that. It says you, in Christian theology you are to be delivered from this present evil world. And it also says in this world you will have sorrow, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. So you're going to have suffering on your doorstep, but it's going to be relatively intelligible. There is no reason to expect that at all if this were just a world of random occurrences. So Kobe Bryant would be dying in a plane crash, and we'd be dealing with the trauma, and you wake up the next day, and another famous person would be in a car crash. And then you go to bed that night, and, you know, Ryan Seacrest, it'd be really random. Ryan Seacrest would, would die of cancer. You know, and you go, Ryan Seacrest? I haven't thought about that guy in a while. And you'd be dealing with that, and like a senator from your state will be shot. 
There would be random evil and suffering and destruction visited upon us all the time if we were just subject to natural, the whims of nature. Even in Camus, who I'm guessing Emerson Green has read, he's one of the most popular existential philosophers. Why? Because it's easy to read. There's a really famous book by Camus called The Stranger. Everyone's read it. Same reason. It's a really fun book to read. You could, it practically reads like a paperback. But it wrestles with some pretty deep issues. At the end of the book, famously, the, the protagonist walks off into, to experience the benign indifference of the universe. The key word there is the giveaway. And I only just thought about it. It only just occurred to me like 10 years ago. And I read, no, read that book a long time ago. There's no such thing as benign indifference. There is no such thing as benign indifference. Indifference is indifferent. In other words, the universe wouldn't care about our suffering at all, ever. There are times where it seems like the universe is indifferent to us, a la Kobe Bryant, but the reason why people find that so traumatic is that those times are relatively rare. They are anomalies. They are the exception that proves the rule. If there were no sovereign being in charge of everything, there'd be no respite. There'd be no reason to expect anything other than misery, sorrow, and suffering in your own life. You would construct a narrative about how things are going to be for you, which most of you live according to, as if there were a God, as if you were protected. Most of you aren't expecting, you know, they're, they're very relatively rare, and the book of Job tries to deal with these, but these are actually rare in the world. They are rare in human experience, and it's really rare to find that they have nothing to do with human agency. So, like, consider even the starving kids in Africa that atheists always point to. There's a lot of meaning for us. See, God wouldn't be indifferent to that. Well, in some ways, God had nothing to do with that. Those starving kids in Africa are not disassociated from a moral universe wherein politics was involved. There is, if you, if you go study the issue, there are plenty of food to feed the entire world. What there isn't is the political will. There's corruption in those, those places. Even when people give money, there's corruption involved. That's not just random. There's human agency involved. Most of the evil and the suffering and the sorrow that you see in this world, human agency is to one degree or another involved. And in Christian theology, we are all, we are, or some of us, I say all, <laughs> I'm not necessarily universalist, so not all. So get over it, Emerson, maybe not you, I don't know. Um, we are heading to a world where it is perfectly aligned with God's sovereign will, and we are to pray, thy will be done as, as it is in heaven, and there is coincidentally no sorrow, no suffering, no sickness, and no death from now until the end of time. Amen. So evil gets reconciled. It's done away with. It is put under the cross, and we live in a world where it doesn't exist. That's according to Christian theology. In this world you will have so so sorrow. In this world you will have struggles. But be of good cheer, I have I've overcome the world. That is also according to Christian theology. Now, the one thing that he says cannot be accounted for at all is gratuitous evil. But actually in this world it's relatively rare. Yes, he brings up an example of an earthquake. When it seems completely disassociated from human agency at all, it's what we call natural evil. And it's what I've pointed to as the only really good argument in favor of naturalism. It's the only thing that, see, that's why I like that he gave us a probabilistic inference to the best ar explanation argument. Because he's saying, what's more, what are you more likely to find? Well, if this were a world of natural occurrences, and that's it, natural processes and random occurrences, we would, we would actually find, and he doesn't notice this, but, mo but if you think, you have to think about this. The things that people find to go, look how evil the world can be, are not things that are right on their doorstep happening to them at random. If this were a world of random occurrences, there's no reason to expect your life to be anything other than random sorrow, eaten by lying type sorrow, sickness, suffering, and death, and it's not going to be. It's not going to be. Most of you know that, confidently. The rare exceptions of the people living to me, listening to me may be in a cancer ward right now or may be having something that's really overpowering right now. But again, the exception that proves the rule, the evil anomaly. If this were a world of just random occurrences where we were just subject to the whims of, of, you know, of, a, of a world where destruction could take, overtake anybody at any time, 
there would be a no, almost no emotional respite from it. None of us would be able to emotionally survive. The, thing, the reason why we find traumatic events so traumatic is because they are relatively rare. There's no reason to expect them to be rare at all if this were just a world of national processes. So his argument actually works against naturalism. Yes, there are times where it seems like he used an example of an earthquake strikes a city and you know we assume that a kid, there was a child caught in a building that collapsed and that child, let's assume that there was gratuitous suffering visited upon that child and it's a child so he had no, no, no reason for it to happen to him at all. How could God allow it? Well, it's relatively rare that God does allow it. A, the turtle on the beach argument is one beach somewhere in the world where it seems like the, the, the moral order of the universe is totally upended from what we actually confidently expect in our own lives. That's my point. Do you understand? If you make an inference to the best explanation, you have to account for what you personally experience. And you, for, for where, from your vantage point, for most of you, you live with lives of, by historical terms, unimaginable ease and comfort and peace and stability and safety. In world historical terms, you're in like the top 1% of the most fortunate people who have ever walked the face of the earth. You aren't the, the person having random evil visited upon you. You aren't the kid in the earthquake. Christ, Christian theology tells you to be grateful for that. To go, there before the grace of God go I, not put the Lord your God to a fool's test. That's an important point of Christian scripture. Because no atheist does. If you understand what that scripture means clearly, and the atheist is going to give me smart out, go, no true Scotsman crap. I mean understanding clearly what it actually means. No atheist actually does put the Lord their God to a fool's test. Fool's test means doing something to upend the moral universe. Uh, let me see, I'm running out of time. I think I'm running out of time. Yeah, I'm rambling a little, but it's fun. Um, 17 minutes, all right, I'll try to wrap it up. So, in other words, he's saying there's gratuitous evil in the world and we should expect none. I don't think we should expect none. That's the point. I, I see no reason to believe that we should expect none. We should expect some. If there were a world that was not governed to some hand by the sovereign will of God, by some sovereign creator, and it was just a world of random processes, we would expect a lot of gratuitous suffering. Not a little, a lot. And not stuff that we turn on TV so we can go, there's a lot out there, a lot in here, in your own life. I confidently expect almost nothing, nothing to visit my doorstep that would actually shake my faith in God. And I mean that. I can only think of one or two things that would really shake me to my core when I really think about it. And they wouldn't necessarily shake my belief in God, they would just, I would just be done with him. I would have nothing to do with him from, because I don't see how I could reconcile it. If I had a kid, what happened to the purpose-driven life guy? I don't know if you know the story, but it's unbelievably tragic. He had a kid, uh, Rick Warren, who killed himself. <laughs> the son who killed himself age 25. Now that would, that would throw me. That happened to me, I don't think I could recover. I would probably still believe in God because my belief in God is based on my actual experience. I couldn't deny what I've actually experienced for the last 20 years. I couldn't throw that out the door, but I would hate him. <laughs> to some degree, I would hate God. Now, that ain't happening to me. There's nothing in my life that... There's, I don't have a son. There's nothing in my life that I could expect almost anything to happen that would throw me. Yes, your parents die, but that's part of life. It's very sad, it's painful, I went, lived through my father's death. It's a part of life. So there's almost nothing, to me personally, that could happen, that could really, really, really shake me. Even the coronavirus stuff. I noticed, you know, myself, how much peace of mind I had. It would, I mean, theoretically, the world, the moral order of the universe could get so torn down and destroyed, you know, that I could actually be shaken in the goodness of life altogether. But as of right now, I am reasonably confident, and so are most of you listening to me, reasonably confident in the moral order of the universe and the goodness and benevolence of life. For you personally, if you don't go looking for the evil anomalies, holding a, a life of relative stability and safety and comfort. Relative, yes, where you're going to have your struggles. If this were a world of just random suffering, there'd be no reason to expect that at all. No reason to expect good to triumph over evil at all, ever. And yet it does. Consistently. Look at World War II, the one that atheists always point to. 
you know, if this, the Nazis were winning World War II. It's one of the first times I started thinking maybe God existed. I was in a conversation with a friend of mine. Just a little side story, but I was in a conversation with a friend of mine. This car I was trying to hit on, actually. And she was in, I was going to go visit, hang out with her in the city that night. And we started talking about God. I don't know how we got on the subject of God. Maybe I weirded her out because I wound up not, not getting together with her. And it started thinking to me like, you know, the Nazis lost. If you go look at the, the history of World War II, the Nazis started out winning. If this were a world where there was no sovereign agency whatsoever, they would have won. There are a lot of weird anomalies and coincidences on the pro side of God existing on the side of the miraculous. And I'll go into videos about that in the future. You don't have to just take my word for it. You can go look them up. You know, starting with the miracle of Dunkirk, the timing of Operation Barbarossa, um, a lot. There's about 50. The, the, the fact that one of the... the one of the air, airplane characters in the, air, the the one of the carriers in Pearl Harbor was mysteriously not in port. Otherwise, the Japanese would have destroyed the entire American fleet. And somehow there was a, there was mysteriously a carrier not there. Then you look at the Battle of Midway. It's practically a miracle of coincidences. If you study it properly, it looks like there was agency. It looks like God's sovereign hand was over the whole thing. That we were losing for a long time, and Nazis started out winning. And in a world of just random occurrences they should have and would have won but for the moral hand of God but for the hand where God decides good ultimately triumphs over evil now we all kind of live with that type of expectation about life that's why Kobe Bryant struck us as so traumatic because that was an upending of that however brief it was the evil anomaly that proves the rule this exception that proves the rule if there was actually a world that was completely indifference, again, what I'm saying is no such thing as benign indifference. God were truly indifferent to us, it would show. It would show, and it would show in how you actually experience life right now. You'd be no safety at all. None. Everything would be on the table, and everything would be up for grabs, and there'd be no protection. Why? Because there is no protection in a world of just natural processes. And you wouldn't be able to trace evil, any evil, suffering in Africa. Most of the time you can comfortably trace suffering, sorrow, sickness, and death, when you're talking about human beings, back to human agency, back to decisions that are what the Christians call sinful at root. You can't disassociate starving kids in Africa from human greed, human will for power, human desire for vainglory. You cannot. Why? Because one caused the other to some degree causally related. If this were truly a world indifferent to the behavior of human beings, which is what you would expect if there were no God, you would expect indifference to the behavior of human beings. And our world doesn't operate like that. The Nazis would have won World War II. Why? Because they were better, better fighters. They had to jump in Operation Barbarossa. They started out kicking really, really deeply winning. The only reason they lost, ultimately, is because they started too late. A, a weird coincidence. A weird coincidence that you wouldn't comfortably expect at all if there were no God. It's true. Go look it up. They started a little bit late. They, they, they originally were going to start Operation Barbarossa a month earlier, and then Hitler decided to invade Greece for a month. So they started a little late, got bogged down in the Russian, Russian winter. That's why they didn't win in the first, first round. Because they got bogged down in the Russian winter. What seemed like, you know, which you could comfortably actually study as the hand of God stopped them. They got caught in the Russian winter, an act of God. We talk about it all the time as an act of God. And we don't disassociate even the natural evil from moral agency. It's very rare that you find one that's an actually gratuitous evil where the kid is, you know, through no fault of his own, is being destroyed in an earthquake. Now, that's the one that he brought up. So let's assume that those do happen. I'm telling you that they're relatively rare. If there were no such thing as God, if there was a world of naturalism, they'd happen all the time. And you'd never be able to live successfully in this world. Why? Because you'd be too stressed out. Happen all the time. We would all be the proverbial turtle on the beach, subject to the whims of cruel and capricious fate, and we're not. We don't experience life like that. Why? Because that's not what life is actually like. The world isn't morally unintelligible. It's completely morally intelligible up to a point. There's only weird parts that are hard to account for. If this were a world where God was totally indifferent or there was no, no God at all, we would expect 
the, the world to be completely morally unintelligible, and yet there's moral agency in the world, moral cause and effect, all the freaking time, could never be accounted for with naturalism. You can never account for just the history of World War II with naturalism. Because it looks, if you study it properly, it looks exactly like God, God let it look like we were going to lose and then stepped in and solved it right here and there. It looked almost exactly like how the Bible explains, you know, the apostles get thrown in jail and five minutes after midnight, God arrives and breaks them out. The history of the world looks a lot like that, <laughs> if, you, if you look at it correctly. Ditto for like the Civil War, I don't know, I'll go, I'll go into that other videos. Ditto for like the Civil War. Same idea. You know, South could very easily won the Civil War. All, all they needed to do was hold on for a little longer, and England might have joined on their side. It seemed like, if you study Gettysburg, the, the Battle of Gettysburg, it's practically miracle coincidence after miracle coincidence. Pick its charge. Go look it up. I didn't make up that these things seem miraculous. Go look it up and think. Try to think of yourself that there is a sovereign God in charge, and isn't that a weird coincidence that they decided to charge Pickett's Hill? Because it, it was the turning point of the Civil War. Had Robert, I mean, I, I guess I'm talking off the top of my head too quickly if you don't know the history, but Robert Lee invaded the North. Had he won the Battle of Gettysburg, that could have been it. The South could have won the war. But he made, oh, famously made, one of the only two or three mistakes he ever made in his life. Pickett's charge was the mistake. And it cost him the battle, which cost them the war. And there's a series of coincidences involved that could never have occurred given naturalism, ever. That's not rare. That's common. Look at the history of your own life. You'll find a series of coincidences that occur that never had occurred given naturalism. And look at your own life and know for a fact that there's no such thing, even in the atheist community, as somebody who puts God to a foolish test. That would be doing something that totally violates and upends the moral order of the universe today now killing your next door neighbor for no particularly good reason. That's the Raskolnikov argument for the existence of God. In other words, he, this guy brought it up a little, I know I'm, I know I'm talking fast and trying to cram in a lot of stuff, but I'm enjoying myself. Uh, let's see, we'll see where I'm at. Okay, I'll try to wrap it up. So the guy brings up the Raskolnikov argument for the existence of God, which posits, even if you killed a kid in the field and there was nobody around to see you and nobody knew you did it, you would still somehow reap the whirlwind. How? That's the Raskolnikov argument for the existence of God in crime and punishment. He thinks, he gives himself the permission to kill, and he, his, 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 his moral fabric of his own universe falls apart past that point. Think about it, really think about it. If you killed your next door neighbor's kid right now, and nobody knew you did it, you got away with it, you still would not be able to live successfully past that act. It's as if the universe itself, as if the universe itself would condemn you from that point forward. Why does it seem like that is? Because that's kind of how it is. Nobody ever actually puts God to a foolish test in biblical terms. Very rare that I did when I was younger. That's how I know this stuff. That's why I believe this stuff. I did. Drugs. Certain types of drugs are putting God to a foolish test. And I almost reaped the whirlwind, as you would expect. Upend the moral order of the universe and you will reap the consequences thereof. As you would expect, if the, even the Hindus talk about the law of karma, how could there be a law of karma? How could we reap what we sow? Ever. Ever. I'm not saying that we do it all the time. I'm saying how could we do it ever if there wasn't some type of moral authority overseeing it all, some type of moral consequences. There cannot be that given naturalism, ever. It's impossible to account for moral moral right triumphing over it's impossible to account for good good triumphing over evil and yet in most situations where the where, where the back our back is up against the walls this is why we won world war ii because certain types of people refused to acknowledge that the evil could ever in fact triumph they knew it despite evidence to the contrary so yeah that was a little that was a little rambly that was a little rambly craig i understand but i'll leave it all as it was and just post it as is that is all for now, kids. I gotta wrap it up. I don't want to go past half hour. I'll do another video on this at some point. Um, that is all for now. The mass ended. Go in peace. Amen.